so if you came in late, Sven is from Mullen Lowe. Uh, he is the International Strategy Director there. Uh, and tonight you're going to talk about localization. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing his expertise. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, the mic seems a bit dodgy, um, but we'll try. I'll, I'll speak loud, and I'm sure this thing will also pick me up if I do. Um, my presentation, possible. But I think in the meantime, just to also reiterate a little bit of my background, because it actually matters a little bit. Um, I now work for Madame Lo, an advertising firm. Um, it's actually a joint venture between a traditional Japanese advertising house, 60 years old, um, called Standard Advertising who um, went into a joint partnership around 10 years ago with the Mullen Lowe Network. Um, and if that isn't, in its essence, what we are talking about today, I don't know what is. Um, before that, I also worked as a qualitative market researcher for many of the global brands that you would be a, very much aware of at um, a, a boutique brand agency called Flamingo. And so there also, it was always about the journey of how do I make um, a global brand with its core essences that globally resonate, how can this also find a Japanese audience? So, before I go into the depth of this presentation, I think we are all here, and clearly there are many of you here, on this topic of localization. And I think it's safe to say that many of us, if not all in this room, agree that localization is a good thing. Something that we intrinsically feel it makes sense. And the reason it makes sense is because we know that the strongest and the most powerful brands we can think of are ones that indeed connect with culture. The two go hand in hand. If we think of the most powerful brands, we often think of the ones that mean something on a very deep level. It's how we think of line when we think of messaging. It's how we think of, Dyson, of, of vacuum cleaning when we think of Dyson. It's, um, it's things such as Kellogg's for breakfast. The two are interlinked. And these, of course, are very global examples, and I think we can think of many more also local ones, such as Ajinomoto for you know, a quick bite in the evening. And to sort of reiterate that point, I wanted to share some great examples to, to show just what localization means. Um, because there are so many brands out there globally we think of as, you, as, as globally the same. Yeah? And, I, and I on purpose chose McDonald's because I think it's the one brand where we think it's the Big Mac place, no matter where you go in the world. But actually they've, they've been incredibly active in localizing across the world from creating vegetarian options, local flavors in India, um, or something such as the Mac Arabia um, in, in Arabia, if you've ever been, which, which sort of tries to connect with, um, with, with an Arab obsession for the shawarma, um, which um, is, tries to replicate. But it goes further than that. Um, and I wanted to share sort of an example that many of you might not be aware of, but it's Samson. And Samson means a lot to people in France. And when I was doing a little bit of research, and, um, and reaching out to, to some stories from other people, I learned actually how Samson has done an amazing job um, going into the, into the French market by doing things, um, actually arriving late to the game. At this point, Sony, um, Philips, Nokia were already very present in the, in the French market. And what, what they did is they came in and said, we want to be part of, of France. So what they did was extensive um, cultural activities, supporting things in museums, um, spending a lot of energy into localizing um, the, the, the interface, um, adding already the applications into the smartphones that were most used by French people when surfing on their mobile phones. Another example, when we're already speaking about the digital world, um, you know, Samsung did something quite grand, but it doesn't always have to be grand. It's things such as that Philips actually does incredibly well in China because it actively um, started this website under Tmall or Taobao, which is the main retail site. Um, and, it, and they really brought in a lot of new expertise to achieve that. And in Japan, of course, just, 
just sort of some examples I'm, I, I would love to share is, is sort of these things such as foreign brands coming in, such as KFC, opening up a karaage shop to say, we understand Japan, Japan has its own um, deep fried chicken culture, we want to be part of that. It's things such as Kit Kat putting matcha into, into its chocolate, Riedel, um, a famous um, maker of, of wine glasses, perhaps even the ones we're drinking from today, who made a sake, special sake glass, or Zwilling, a German brand of knives using Japanese artisanry craft. And it's all to say, we understand, we understand, we are, we are speaking the same language. And I wanted to share those examples because those are the, the pretty easy ones I think we all come to when we think of localization and making something Japanese or making something from another country. But it's also a lot of other things that we can think of when we think of localizations. It's things such as, for example, Mercedes um, actually, as you might all be familiar with, um, opened, opened this store, the Mercedes Connection, and this is, this is completely different to anything it's done anywhere else. And it was really because Mercedes understood that the Japanese consumer is quite um, interested, um, if not um, downright needy, to see um, the kind of environment a certain brand exists. They want to be able to, to really delve into it. And this is why you see, especially in the Omotosando area, so many flagship stores, so many brand stores for brands that in other parts of the world you just don't see retail spaces like that. Um, it's things such as also Ben & Jerry's, I thought we'll stay in the Omotosando area, things such as on the outside it very much looks like any old Ben & Jerry store, uh, ben and, ben and Jerry store, though of course a little bit more luxurious. But they've gone through a very long process of trying to understand um, Japanese consumer needs on how you buy food, how you go to a counter. Things such as that um, you actually here get, get a table mat put in your hand so you can start choosing your flavor before you go to the ice cream counter so you don't have to have the embarrassing um, exchange um, of oh well maybe cherry garcia mm -hmm. oh no there's a um, there's a queue forming behind me which which of course japanese really don't like and what i really wanted to get at is that localization and and is actually quite a fuzzy word um, it's a word that that encapsulates absolutely everything. I mean, we can even go as far as um, how a company works internally um, can also be localized. It's ultimately when a certain company, a certain product, or a certain brand tries to go, we are now part of a different um, ecosystem, a different cultural context, and we will change and adapt accordingly. And this, of course, is very powerful. But the important thing, and this is what I really want you to leave with, is that it ultimately is about profound insight into local pref preferences. And I'll go into that a little bit more now. Because ultimately, localization is a powerful force to help the consumer connect, but only when it is done right. So now bringing this to Japan, we are in Japan, it's only fair that we talk about Japan, and I wanted to sort of share some thoughts on that actually when we talk about Japan and when we think about Japan often we are a little bit off the mark and this means that we have actually what, what I refer to here the distorted image of the average and I wanted to share here this is this is um, from a book from uh, Yoshio Sugimoto it's one of those books that when you study Japanese studies it's pretty much in lesson one um, introduction to Japanese society and when I studied Japanese at Cambridge this was really the first book I read and to this day I remember the this passage really on the first page of the first chapter where, where Sugimoto makes this very interesting observation about Japan which is um, when we think of Japan we have this image of the, the salary man we have this image of a slightly older gentleman who's been in, who's been in employment for his whole life, um, who lives on the outskirts of Tokyo, and he makes this interesting point that in in so many ways that's not the Japan we that actually exists. And so he says, as you can see here, um, if you're if you're looking at it whilst I'm talking, um, is that if an alien were to make the journey to Japan and were to meet the most representative person of Japan. 
It would be a woman. She wouldn't um, have a university education. She wouldn't be in full-time employment, and she wouldn't be unionized. So she, she, it's, it goes completely against the image we have of Japan. And to take that further, I think there's so many myths that we actually um, have of Japan that are fundamentally not true, but they drive wrong decisions. So things such as Japan's homogenous. It's one of those phrases that we see constantly. We see it in the BBC. We see it in Bloomberg. We, ha we, we even think it, no matter how well educated we are. But the fact is that actually, according to most statistics, 5 to 8% of people in Japan are foreign or, or indeed ethnic minorities. Now, we don't think of that. We don't think of the many Chinese, the Koreans who live here. We only think of the very few white people who live in Tokyo, and that's just not the reality. J Japanese are middle class. Another one of those wonderful factoids that everybody throws out, but the reality is almost 40% of the workforce are part-timers. Um, and more shockingly, as, what I, as I was doing the research for this, was that actually Japan has um, a relative poverty of 15.3%, um, which is only topped by America, the one country where you think of when you think of poverty in the first world. And they're 17.3%. That's not such a big gap. And um, this was recently in a Japan Times article um, where they were quoting um, a report from UNICEF that actually Japan ranks 34th out of 41 developed nations in terms of child poverty index. It was like, quite hard to swallow, actually. Um, the same thing goes, of course, for the, the, the wonderful myth of the hardworking and the efficient Japanese, when actually the OEC report says that Japan has the lowest level of output on actual hours of work amongst the leading economies in the world. Painful, but it's true! <laughs> and, but what, what does this lead to? It leads to a lot of wrong assumptions that then lead to wrong localization. And I wanted to share a couple of anecdotes um, actually from my previous work in market research. Market research, as you can imagine, is a lot of focus groups and um, a lot of me sitting in the back room taking notes whilst it happens. And what happens so often is that people start second-guessing others. So you would show an idea or a concept to somebody and, and um, like for example, a shampoo. It's usually shampoo in market research. Um, and you say to this woman, what do you, do, you, do you like this? And she goes, well, I think a 35 to 40 year old woman housewife would really like this. It's like, yeah, yeah, yes, but you, uh, who are you, but you, you are 35, aren't you? And aren't you a housewife? I remember that from the recruitment criteria. Yeah, 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 so what do you think? I don't like it. Oh, okay, um, but why? Why, why don't you like it? Oh, well, for these reasons. But you know, anyway, I'm not rep representative of, of Japanese women. But you hear that constantly. And, and most focus groups have that, have, or have that, that, uh, that, that, how can I say, that retort, retort um, to most questions. Like, oh yes, but this is, but this is Japan. This is, this is, this is, I'm different. Yes, but if every single one in the focus group is different and this is the target, then surely who are the Japanese then, right? And we, we, this, this, this um, goes even further when, when we speak to certain clients and, and, and they, they, there's just so many assumptions on what Japan is. So even when you speak to a client, they would say, ah, oh, this can't work in Japan because Japanese don't like fragrance. And then actually, you take it to a focus group and you finally break through the barrier of the Japanese don't like fragrance and then all of the women in the focus group say, no, I love this, this is great. And this, this was some, one of, sort of the key learnings that I, I took away from this job was that you shouldn't just trust your own instinct on things like this, particularly in a place such as Japan where we are all so obsessed with talking about Japan as if it is this defined singular entity that it's the same five years ago and it's going to be the same in five years time and somehow we, we all know what Japan is but I think all of us have had experiences where the Japan we know 
didn't happen. Um, things we expected did not happen. Sometimes the service is indeed shit, and we did not expect it. And to take that point even further, um, I wanted to, leave, to also share with you some um, examples of companies who, honestly, at the research stage, nobody would have thought had any likelihood of succeeding through simple things such as lush, oh, that's really smelly, and who would put a bath bomb in a, in a, in a, in a bath? Japanese like to uh, take baths in clean water, and they wash beforehand, and yeah, well, now there's a lush at every corner, so clearly that was wrong. Um, Ikea, oh yeah, Japanese, they love nitori, and they love um, small furniture, and, and they like very, very um, basic beige design. Well, Ikea just opened another store in Kumamoto. Um, crisp salad works. Japanese don't like raw salads. They don't like it with um, dressings beyond goma. And, and then this place opened up in Azabu Juban, where salads are not only cut, diced, made small, you eat it with a spoon in every possible way, not Japanese. And the queues won't end from the moment it op opens in the, at 11 a.m. until 11 p.m. And the same, of course, goes for Amazon and Costco. And this really raises then the question of, well, is localization always right? Is it always right to assume the Japanese are this, therefore we need to give them this? Or should we actually go a little bit further, try to understand what is really at the root of their behavior? And I then also wanted to raise this, and, and I ultimately would love to have a discussion with you um, about this. But I also feel, looking at Japan over the last um, five or so years, is actually Japanese, the people I'm speaking to in focus groups, are becoming ever less different. Um, you know, it's, it's the small things. It's the small things such as that people like to eat bigger portions these days. And you can, there are many things that you, we can, we can uh, point at as possible reasons why this would be. Um, it's things such as worries, worries of income. So if you eat, you want to eat bigger, so you don't have to eat the next, um, the next meal moment. Um, things such as YouTube usage, which is really interesting, actually. Um, until recently, um, everybody assumed Japanese are only going to consume music by buying a CD or renting a CD from Staya, and they would never do anything illegal. Well, YouTube came along, and now actually most people listen to music via YouTube. Um, to tire and, 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 and actually CD sales are an all-time low. Changes in travel behavior. Nobody wants to go anymore on a tour group. Um, people want to have their own holiday experiences. They're going to more um, crazy locations. They want to plan it themselves. HIS is, a, as a result, not doing very well. But it is much more in a Western mindset, you could say, of, of creating your own holiday, taking an adventure political unrest, um, people are starting to speak out about how things are in, in politics in Japan in a way that hasn't happened before, really similar to what we're seeing in Europe and the US, Facebook and interaction, people are more and more actually in, engaging with each other, you know, the word kizuna I think we're all very aware of, but also things such as people are now okay with using their real name on Facebook. When Facebook first came to Japan, the thought was, no, 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 no. Japanese would never use their real name. Oh, no, 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 no. They want to, they want to stay anonymous. Mixi is going to forever be Japan's networking or, or sort of um, friendship network space. Well, they were wrong. And of course, there are many, many more examples. And I'm sure you've got some more buzzing around in your head. So what that means is great brands do look localize, but they also know when not to localize because they know what is true about them that actually resonates at a more visceral, deeper level globally. And I and and from my experience, I can say that often localizing becomes almost um, like like a weapon from a local office versus a global office by saying, oh, they don't understand Japan, when actually the frustration is much more the communication between the local office and HQ and the feeling HQ doesn't understand me, without trying to understand that maybe something about the global story is actually good and actually has a viable, um, you know, some, something that can realistically survive also in Japan. And so 
that really leads me, I think, to the important point, and I think it's one of those, again, we can all agree on, which is they, great brands preserve something that is foreign and authentic um, with a Japanese interface. And so this, this is, I think, the key point for um, successful localization globally. And this is, not, this is not just limited to Japan. When you have a great idea, may it be an Uber, may it be an Airbnb, may it be the iPhone, they tend to hold true wherever they go. For the simple reason, they, they connect and they solve a much deeper need. We all have the need for better quality for lower prices. We all have the need for efficiency, fast, speed, efficacy, all of that. It, you're not going to find a single person in the world, not even in Dubai, who is willing to say, I would rather pay more for the same thing. And that's really the thought I wanted to leave you with, and I want to therefore say thank you. But before we go into clapping, um, <laughs> I hope, um, I did also bring a video, um, because as Sir Corp likes itself, I would like to plug myself too. Um, I have an interesting video of, of a great brand example that, that, that brought all of this alive. Um, and it's work by Mullen Lowe. Um, and I wanted to share this. And um, when people start snoozing, or we can switch it off. But until then, I thought I'll let this run. Oh. Sound. Oh. If, if there's problems with the sound, I can also explain the story, because it's more about a, about the story. So, um, completely moving away from Japan and actually talking about, um, again, a very global story that started in Brazil, there's this one brand under Unilever um, called Omo. And Omo has many different names in different markets. Um, and once you see the end of the video, I think, I'm sure you will recognize one of them. But they actually did global research into the positioning of this, this laundry detergent. And laundry detergent was, until this point, very much about how clean can you get your clothes. And it was always about, look at my white shirt, it's 10% cleaner than that white shirt. And what they then did is they were looking for this high value idea. So this was an idea that is globally true um, and isn't limited to, to a single market. And they came to this idea to turn things on its head and actually say, dirt is good. Dirt is not the enemy, but dirt is a good thing. Because dirt is a sign of you having done something. It's about getting dirty, getting down with, with, with um, the material. And they used this as this global idea um, that was completely activated and used differently, market by market, using different references. Um, but fundamentally, it came down to this thought of a child only properly grows when it, when it becomes dirty, when it goes out into the wood and explores, when it would paint, when it would go and, and, and play around with soldering irons. And, and Market by market, they did it very differently. And even in the markets where, um, where dirt is something that's quite negative, so places such as Japan and, and Vietnam, they, they turned it on its head again and made it more about creativity, and it also worked there. And this, is, this I thought, is quite emblematic of, of successful global with local. Yeah. And I think we can stop the video at this point. So that's it. Um, now you can thank me. Yeah. Um, or we can go straight into questions. OK, uh, we've got about 15 minutes of q and I'm sure you've got lots of questions. Uh, who wants to? <laughs>